Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from. My name is Abhijit Bhaduri. I work as a talent advisor to organizations and individuals who are looking to upskill and be part of this vibrant skills economy, which we are all going to be a part of. My guest today has a couple of interesting aspects to him. So he has lost his wallet multiple times, once in the parking lot, twice at the airport, and has managed to find it for some strange reason. He manages to find those every time. He has the distinction of carrying a friend across seven or eight kilometers while they went hiking and this friend broke an ankle uh, over the Satpura mountain range, uh, you know, trying to do that. And of course, uh, you know, the other interesting element is that he got selected to the Delhi School of Economics. I didn't sort of uh, look up the admissions list because he was absolutely sure that he is not going to ever make it. So it was only when his father said that, when did you go and look it up, that he actually managed to do that. This gentleman, uh, let me say that he is uh, not only a well-known actor and director, uh, both on screen as well as in theatre. The other hint I'm going to give for you is that he is instrumental in reviving the lost art form of storytelling called Dasta and Goi, which he has later expanded in Kisebazi. He runs a theatre company called Hoshroba Repertory in uh, Mumbai. Of course, I'm going to be delighted to introduce my friend... Danish Hussein. Gosh, <laughs> those are very impressive photographs. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Abhijit. It's, it's such an honor to be here and to reconnect with you. Um, well, these photographs are good to see my photographer friends, uh, very skilled professional people who, uh, without uh, any kind of uh, fee or anything, just happily come and shoot me and then pass over these few photographs for me for moments like these that it can be used. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's, it's just reminding me that when we first met, which is almost like a decade from now, and uh, you were with uh, Vipro India at that time, and you had uh, invited me to conduct a workshop on storytelling with the personnel at Vipro, which was in this very fancy studio, Ramaji studio in Hyderabad. And I had turned up there uh, day one with a black nose because That's right. <laughs> I was coming to the studio. I had an accident where I hit my head against the headrest uh, in front of me in the car. And I just, I had a black nose, which was very embarrassing, but there wasn't much I could do about it. So the whole storytelling workshop began with a, with a very interesting story of why this man has a black nose. <laughs> I, and it was incredible. It still remains one of the uh, workshops that people still uh, talk about. In fact, I met uh, one of the participants the other day and he mentioned Tanish Hussain in, in one of those films. And I said, yes, sorry. So he's got a thriving career now in films and all that. And thank you so much for taking time today. Thank you. Like. Most welcome. This is a, a workshop which is all about careers and how people right. uh, sort of have different kinds of careers. So you've had a pretty interesting Shift. You right. did not start off being an actor because I know that you studied to be an economist. At least you went to Delhi School of e Economics. Subsequently, to uh, you know, did a business uh, degree. You know, at FMS, Faculty of Management Studies. You had a degree in that and MBA. You joined the bank and you left the bank. Talk to me about that. What what did when you were growing up? What did you want to be? What was your? If somebody has said, what do you want to be when you grow up? What would that be? You know, I was. Growing up in a traditionally middle-class house where the aspirations are pretty straight-jacketed, either you be a bureaucrat or you be an engineer or you be a doctor or you go abroad and get a degree, a PhD and be an academic. So very standard career paths, they were there. Both my parents were academics. My father was a research economist uh, at the Agroeconomics Research Center, which was uh, an adjunct affiliated uh, institute to Delhi School of Economics. And my mother was a professor of Persian literature at the uh, University of Delhi at, at the Arts Faculty. So uh, you can kind of understand as to what kind of aspirations my parents had. And also, uh, we were living in uh, an era which was pretty insular of information, most of the information about what career should be or what life should be it was very much what you were getting from your parents and your uncles and extended network of friends and families around you. The mainstream information was really a newspaper or television, and which was really one way. Uh, there was no way to interact. We did not know of other career paths 
or how sustainable those career paths are. So I was also very much like that. Either I be a bureaucrat or I be an engineer or I be an academic. Very soon I realized that I could not be bureaucrat, engineer or doctor. Any such career path which required clearing a competitive exam, I realized I'm not good at that. I can't crack that. So automatically the options of being a civil servant, of being an engineer or being a medical doctor dropped out because I was just that, you know, I wasn't good enough to crack on competitive exams. So so when I uh, gave the entrance exam for Delhi School of Economics, I was pretty sure I would not make it. And for three days, I just didn't bother to go and check the admission list notice. Till my dad, uh, who of course was working in the same institute, came back home and, and said, why are you not going and depositing your fee for Delhi School of Economics? And I said, what fee? And he said, well, you've made it. Your name is on the admission list. And because we used to live very near to the university, so I, I immediately took my bike and I, I went straight to the Delhi School of economics and saw my name on the list and next year of course I deposited my fee in Delhi School of Economics uh, almost everyone uh, once they are finishing their second year their masters most of the people are applying for their PhDs uh, mm -hmm. various Ivy League universities so I did the same thing so basically I didn't really have any vision of what I wanted to be. I was just doing what I was told or I was just doing what I was seeing other people do and when I Finally got the admission in University of West Virginia for environmental economics, a PhD in environmental economics. And all my costs were covered, you know, tuition waiver and all those graduate assistantship. Uh, I just developed cold feet. And I said, um, look, it's I barely managed to clear D-school. I don't think I can go to a cold country far away and study another four years and then get a degree. So please spare me, don't push me. I don't want to go to the US. And my dad, uh, surprisingly, agreed to it and that took me to the corporate world um, and I got into the banking and that's time when post-liberalization the economy was opening up and you had all these multinational banks and institutions coming in so I applied and I got the job and I started working for them this is bonhomie with the banking culture and the corporate world it was very short-lived and uh, very very Quickly, I started realizing that this is not really something that I'm enjoying. I'm not thriving in it. I'm just in the wrong departments where career growth is quite stunted. The departments where the career growth is faster within the banking industry, I'm somehow not making in, uh, into those departments. And, and the culture, the culture of uh, you know, sycophancy and basically uh, too much networking and glib talking and being in the good books of the higher managerial position bosses, that wasn't really sitting with me well you know I was I still kind of believed in the old style of banking where you basically first satisfy the customer and make sure a satisfied customer gives you more business whereas culture was becoming more about just turning banks into FMCG and you're just a, as if you're selling soaps and shampoos and, and it doesn't matter whether the customer is satisfied or not you just expand the customer base and get in whatever business and show numbers on Excel charts at the end of the day so all this uh, led to a kind of a disappointed, disgruntled existence, which was not really good for my own mental health and for my own good being. And meanwhile, I also started exploring activities which will keep my evenings engaged. And that led me to theatre. And over a period of three years of overlapping between theatre and banks, I realized theatre is something that I'm enjoying most. And perhaps maybe this is something that I should pursue. And that led me to resign, which was year 2002, roughly around 31, 32 years years of age and since then it's 2023 and we are sitting here and we are talking so it's like two decades when you look at the whole preparation for being an actor you've actually had the opportunity to learn from you know the biggest names in theater whether it was Barry John or MS Satyu or Nasiruddin Shah and Habib Tanvir and all the greats of Indian theater when was this was this while you were growing up or was this after Delhi School of Economics when you decided this was when I switched to theater. Uh, I mean, Barry, uh, of course, happened when I was still working in bank and, and I was looking for options to engage, to make my evenings better. And I realized I wanted to do theater, but I had no prior experience in theater. And I started looking for information and Barry's name had become big at that time. This was 1998 and both Shah Rukh Khan and Manoj Bajpai had kind of become huge. So everybody was talking about this one theater director in Delhi who, who was uh, kind of a mentor to these people. And I sought him out and he asked me, do you have any experience? And I said, no. And he said, well, come over and attend a workshop, which led to my first 
acting workshop, kind of my first grounding in acting. And when I joined Barry John's workshop, that's the first time when I realized actually that it is a skill. It's not really that if you feel intuitively you can act, you can act. It's a serious skill. You have to kind of acquire the wherewithals of acting and you need to apply those. And over a period of time with rehearsals, with application, with understanding, with research, you will be getting closer to a more accurate portrayal of the characters that you want to do. So that's the first time when I realized that the skill that needs to be acquired and practiced and learned and applied before you could see results. So when you think about acting today versus, let's say, the version of acting that you chose to pursue and build your career in, how has that evolved? And, you know, How would you have defined it then versus when you are thinking about it as a career? If somebody says, this is what I have to do, what's the difference? So, you know, there is a clear division in my career. I mean, I started off as a stage actor and for a good decade, I was just a stage actor. Then I kind of started doing cinema and became a screen actor. And now I pursue both screen and stage together. So when I became a screen actor, I realized two things. First thing I realized was that we are not the generation that were born with camera and cell phones and social media and gadgets. So we were very self-conscious when the camera would come on us. I, because I had some kind of foolhardiness or, you know, uh, some kind of rashness in me on stage, I didn't have a problem. I never became self-conscious on stage. On stage, I would be very comfortable in my natural self and performing and acting. But the moment I came in front of the camera, I would become very self-conscious suddenly my mannerism would change, my body language would change, I would be very self-aware. And that was a problem, which I realized the generation after a stone because they've grown up with cell phones and social media. So it took me a while to ignore the camera. It took me a while to train myself to not let camera be on my mind and not uh, hinder my performance. That was there. And that was the first thing which the self-consciousness of the camera. That was the first mm -hmm. which I realized. And then I also realized that the process of finding a character whether on stage or on camera is similar. But the implementation of that is different because of the medium changing. So on stage you are physically presenting yourself to the audience and it's most of the time unidimensional in the sense that the audience is in front of you physically the direction of your performance is straight ahead or some kind of a quadrant where you are you know varying between that quadrant so it requires skills like projection it requires skills like making sure that even when you are loud uh, you don't make it over the top and you still make it palatable for the audiences to get the nuances of what performances are and that quickly changes when you come in front of the camera because here the audience is literally reaching up close to you. So suddenly your whole performance changes. Right? You don't need to be projecting. You don't need to be mindful of where the audience is sitting. You just have to be as natural as you could. The rest the camera would do. And the other thing that I realized was that in order to have the cinema acting uh, effective, you need to understand the edit and you need to understand the shot taking. So you must be able to understand which is the shot that could make it into the edit for the for the film. How do you know that? What is the process of doing it? Purely by observing it, by watching cinema, by observing uh, filmmaking on the set. And I started realizing that, you know, a, sh a scene is divided between different shots. There is a wide shot, a master shot, a mid shot, a over the shoulder, close ups. All these shots are stitched together to make one proper scene that you would see eventually when the film comes on the screen. In terms of the performance, the emotional performance, the close up shots are the more important one because that's where you're face is coming full on the screen and all the emotions and everything that you're saying has to come on your face but then when it's a wide shot or a master shot when the camera is far away it's more physical acting so that means your posture the way you are standing the way you are gesticulating all these are important and you have to make sure that what you did in the wide shot which is mainly physical acting where it was the body so it's like I'm standing by the roadside and I see the two men are fighting I'm not able to understand the context but I can see see their bodies moving in a particular way which gives me an impression that there is kind of a scuffle happening there and when I reach close to them that's when I see them really lunging at each other with ferocious words and expressions so 
my first observation of them standing across the street and my walking up to them and then seeing actually up close what is it that they're saying is match it. Similarly, so I have to do the same thing in acting as to uh, I have to make sure that when a white shot when a, uh, comes and the audience members see me standing or doing something and suddenly when the camera cuts and zooms to my face there is a consistency between what they saw there and what they're seeing on my face up close. These things started making sense and that gave me an idea okay when this shot is happening this is where my focus should be I should be more looking at the physical performance when the the shot comes closer I should be looking more in terms of my emotional performance when the camera is on my co-actor I just need to give my lines correctly and not really be performing in the sense the camera is not on me so understanding the edit and the shot taking was very important given effective performance then you could calibrate your performance and make sure that you give the right pitch or tone when that particular shot comes and not that if there are 15 takes you are performing with the same energy in all 15 of them because then you're basically wasting your energy so you know these things slowly and slowly started dawning on me and, and I started realizing that as the medium of the performance changes you have to calibrate your performance and you, you have to make sure that your performance suits that medium that particular medium so as to be more effective with the audiences you know when you think about your craft as uh, an actor you also you are an avid reader you, you've learned various languages. Talk to me about those things. Where do they fit in? And the reason why we are sort of really talking about that is, you know, one of the things that I talk about in my book, Career 3.0 is one of the big skills to build is how do you teach yourself things that you do not know? What is that method of doing that? And, you know, you learned languages, you picked up the nuances of pronunciation, you sort of really build expertise. It's not just a casual dabbling that we are talking about. You know, how do you do that? Well, I think, that, you know, I remember, Abhijit, there was one performance of Dastan Gui and post-performance there was a QA and it was at some college when that we were performing. So we had these young undergraduates sitting there, the whole auditorium bristling with them and post-performance. So they really loved the performance and it was, of course, in Urdu. And post-performance, one of the kids stood up and asked this question to me that, you know, your bio says that you went to Delhi School of Economics and FMS and this and that. And now you, your career is kind of performing stories of Urdu. So don't you think you had a wrong education? Shouldn't you have been studying this all your life and not going and studying economics and banking? And I, I laughed at that time and I just said I just went to wrong schools but uh, the truth is this that no education goes waste what we study why we what study maybe because of many circumstantial things happening in our lives and we end up doing whatever we end up doing but supposedly you have reached a certain stage in your life and now you want a career switch you want to do something else in your life it does not mean what you've done before is a waste because uh, one of the things about us human beings is that the skill that kind of differentiates us from other species is our ability to read patterns, our ability to draw inferences by studying data and then draw inferences and see patterns there. Mm -hmm. And you might have studied something different. You might, have, you might have studied medicine, you might have studied, somebody has studied engineering, somebody has studied mathematics. But the picture, the blocks of acquiring education are very similar. The way we, we uh, you know, declassify and deconstruct or classify things and then assimilate knowledge and then process it and then regurgitate it and apply it uh, in our real lives, that process is very similar. That is not changing. Once you kind of understand the template once you kind of understand how you acquire knowledge. So if you're just looking at one stream of career as a mountain and then the next stream of career as the next mountain, it might just be very Herculean and a very daunting task that, oh, I need, now need to cross another mountain. But once you kind of deconstruct that and see beyond and look at the template of acquiring knowledge, you realize that it's pretty similar. So if I've done something like this, it would not take me long to kind of understand something else. And once you start getting those hacks, it becomes easier for you to kind of do the next thing. It's just like when you're writing your first book, I'm sure when you wrote your first book, it must have been very daunting. And it yes. was like, oh, I can never finish writing a book. And then you wrote it and then you realized, oh, this is my learning, which you applied and which kind of became your learning curve. And the second time when you wrote it, it didn't take you that much time. And slowly and slowly, you know, you realize that, okay, there is a method to it. And you apply that methodology, you apply those templates and things start happening. 
And I think it's the same thing for going from one book to the other book. Now, it might be that the first book you wrote was a fiction, while the second book you wrote Which is true. Was fiction. So yep. basically, you are, in that sense, literally going into something very different. You know, it's mm -hmm. non-fiction. But in the process, you realize that the hacks are kind of similar. It's just the content which is changing. But the process of writing the book is not really different. Similarly, it might seem to you it's a great career change. And I have to literally rebuild myself or start from the scratch. But the thing is this, the process is pretty similar of acquiring knowledge, of processing it, of assimilating it, and then applying that knowledge in order to get results. That process is very similar. And once we start understanding that, it becomes becomes easier to acquire different skills. So I think people should not see it as that life altering or that daunting that, you know, this requires me getting a rebirth in order to do it. No, you can, you can just do it. Just whatever knowledge you've acquired so far, don't think it's a waste and just look for the methodology, the template, what is behind the curtain, behind the scenes, and then apply that understanding and it would become easier to acquire the new knowledge. Was there anybody in your family who was an actor who therefore you could rely on and say, if that person can do it, I can do it as well? No, no. the first one. No, uh, I was the first one. My daughter is the first one who's a singer in our family. So absolutely not. And uh, one great example is my sister. My sister was uh, an English major from Delhi University. She went to Delhi University, did her master's in English literature. And then she got married and she came back here. She came here to the US. I'm in the US right now. I'm, in fact, I'm in her house right now. And as it happens, she, you know, she was newly married. She gave birth to a child. So she became more involved with house help, rearing the child. And then my father suffered from a, a chronic kidney disease. So he had a chronic renal failure. And uh, my sister, this was year 2000, she was visiting India. And she was completely frustrated by her experience in the hospitals in terms of getting information on my father and in terms of uh, making sure that he gets the best treatment. So she got so frustrated that she came back to the US and she went to the university saying that she wants to apply and want to be a doctor. The university told her that because you didn't have science stream in your high school and in your inter, you cannot study for or MBBS, but you could still be a nurse practitioner. And she studied nurse practitioning and she studied over eight years, acquired whatever stages and degrees of nurse practitioning and to Today, she's a very successful nurse practitioner, has been for the last 15 years, working in major hospitals here in the Detroit area, completely uh, well-versed with all medical knowledge. It, it's amazing that she started off when she was 29, 30. In over the next two decades, she has built a very successful career as a nurse practitioner. So I'm saying that acquiring a new skill is really not as daunting as it may seem. It's really the willingness to go back to school and the willingness to open yourself again and the willingness to be open to any knowledge that is coming your way. The more we remove the filters that we have, the more we remove the blockages, it will become easier for us to kind of imbibe the knowledge that's coming our way. And then it's a simple process of application. You know, you learn, you apply, sure. you observe, and that's how we move forward. When you let banking, one of the reasons that you talked about was that it was hard to be part of that ecosystem when, you know, you had to suck up to various people and people around were, you know, you saw them doing a lot of this. Now, I am not from the ecosystem that you are in, which is acting and performing arts and all of that. But what I read about in all the gossip magazines and the columns is that it's not different that you still have to suck up to the, you have to be part of the scam and you have to be sucking up to this particular director. Is that true? Is it, you know, you've been an insider in both theater as well as movies. Is that true? See, human beings are human beings. And one of our characteristic is tribalism because that's how we actually survived when the hunter-gathering uh, period was there in our lives, is that your best survival was uh, being part of a collective. So when you be part of a collective, the chances of you thriving, surviving is better. And this tribalism is so inherent and so ingrained in us, it's very difficult to break. But that's not really the situation. So it's very much ingrained. So I think irrespective of what field you are in, you will see these social dynamics at work, somebody being alpha, somebody taking the lead, somebody, you know, herdism is happening, few people going there. It all happens. But also, you know, the kind of industry that we have, eventually, it's your work that would speak for you. It's no amount of uh, politics, networking, buttressing, people backing you is going to really lead you anywhere. At the end of the day, if you cannot 
act well on screen it will be palpable to the audiences if you're not a good filmmaker it'll be it'll be very much showing to the audiences so you know the brass tax is this that if you do not have the nuts and bolts to show what you want to show the audiences will very quickly look through you and you will not be able to sustain yourself so i think eventually uh, in our industry it doesn't really matter what camp you are or, or who you are supporting or yes you might speed up your career sometimes by joining some bandwagon you might find it difficult if you choose another path but i think eventually it is really about your ability to tell stories and how effectively you can use the skills and the tools that are there to tell those stories effectively and if that you can do then you will excel eventually i think in my book i talk about storytelling is one of the skills for the future you've been a professional storyteller starting with all your experiences in career in films and theater and now of course as you are running your own repertory what is in your mind a story and what is a storyteller and why does it matter if i'm not part of the performing arts why does storytelling even matter so you know uh, uh, one of the things that you mentioned was about being part of multiple ecosystems one of the reasons why you would see me as a person in multiple ecosystems is because i do not see those systems as different systems i just see them stories getting implemented in a different way so i essentially see myself as a storyteller and sometimes if that story needs to be said as a poem i say i write it as a poem sometimes if that story needs to be said as a i direct a play for stage sometimes that story if needs to be said in in a film medium that i it becomes a screenplay so essentially these multiple ecosystems are coming because primarily the storyteller i am deciding as to what is the medium i want to tell my story better in and thus i end up being in that ecosystem where that story is being told so eventually i would say that we all are storytellers actually everybody is a storyteller you are you are a storyteller i am a storyteller because at the end of the day this is we want we have a story and we want to pitch that story to other so they become stakeholders in the story and more people become stakeholders in a story the more the resources that story will get which would mean that large number of people would be able to sustain themselves better so essentially everybody is doing a story there's a tech story happening there is a political story happening there is a cultural story happening there is a art story happening there is a fashion story happening uh, there is a culinary story happening so at every level somebody is telling you a story and the whole idea is this it's not really the food it's It's not really the tech of the iPhone. It's not really the the tech of the say Streamyard. It's really the story of behind this that should peg itself in the stakeholder's mind, and that would attract a stakeholder towards this product or towards this experience or towards this film or towards this restaurant. And that once they come in and what their experience is matches the story that you've told, they are sold, and that would eventually result in higher volumes happening for whatever your stake is. So I think everybody is a story. Storyteller, and when you are preparing to pitch your story to a stakeholder, you have to make sure that the most important thing that you realize what is it that your audience, who is your audience, and what they want to listen. So you bring in your story in a manner. where they feel that they were not aware of this but latently you have tapped into a need which you have been able to identify just that you present it in a manner where it seems something very normal and they get attracted towards you and also it is very deeply tied to our own our own inherent wish to experience new thrills so you know the moment people are exposed to something which is outside the purview of their experience they automatically gets to get attracted to it and brief i think it's not really that only one particular tribe of people are story teller i think everybody is doing storytelling everybody is the storyteller that is really the skill that we all should be good at if we want whatever industry we are in if we want to thrive in that the skill of being a good storyteller when you think of pursuing your career in the performing arts mm. as you have do you need to have higher degree of risk taking than so the people who choose other professions you need to have higher tolerance for ambiguity you need to have a higher tolerance for failure which of these is true or all of them all of them i think and because i have experienced a lot of time you know when i've been invited for corporate workshops including the one that i went uh, where you invited me and this is a very regular refrain that i hear is that oh how brave of you that you were able to break the corporate you know shackles and mm-hmm. whoever you are i also want to do this i also want to do this but i just don't find guts enough to do this and a lot of times you know they have genuine reasons i mean they have their circumstances are such that they can't break through sure. 
think that it is also a, a lot of how your temperament is. Are you a risk averse person or are you a uh, you know risk favoring person? And if you are a risk taking person, irrespective of what circumstances are, you will kind of take the leap. I think I was the risk taking kind. I mean, my circumstances were no different. I had an alien father whom I take to hospital thrice a week. I had a young girl, four or five years old at that time, and I had not bequeathed or inherited a huge wealth uh, from my parents or from my ancestors. So a lot of these circumstances were very similar, and I, I just took the jump. Thankfully, mercifully, people around me were very supportive of me, and there was no pressure emotionally from the people around in my family. So I'm saying that a lot depends really on what your own temperament and what your own conditioning is. I mean, a lot of people they have grown up in cultures where possibly their conditioning is risk averse, and they. They would stick to a safe choice and to a monthly check coming in their account. And mm -hmm. some of the people we've seen in our childhood, people taking risks around us and somewhere it has you know, seeped inside us. And when our moment comes, we take that jump, we take that leap, and we are able to do it. So it is there. Also, like this other question that you asked me, the, the tolerance to failure. I was aware when I took the leap. I did not know what my path will be. I did not know where will I end up being. But I was pretty much aware that the success rate of this career choice is very low. Only 1%, 2% actually make it to a situation where they become household name or, or they get immense wealth. Most of the people, they kind of fall by the wayside and I was pretty aware of that I also had some kind of a pocky confidence that you know, I will be able to pull it off because uh, when I started this that was the first time I received appreciation from audiences and I realized that okay maybe there is something that I'm good at and it's only a question of applying myself further to become better at it. And if I'm becoming better at it, the chances I will mess it up is only if I'm really foolish or stupid. Otherwise, I won't be able to. So I kind of went ahead, but I was always aware that one needs to be prepared that most of the time you would be failing. You would be auditioning, you would not get the role, you would be meeting people, but it would not fructify into projects. And that is the nature of the beast. You know, you can't really hold grudges against anybody. You just have to take it on your chin and move forward. And that's what I really did. So it's also like, in some sense, you have to become Zen and make sure that every time there is a debacle or you're kind of failing, you make it an opportunity to learn something and reassess yourself and understand what is it that was not working for them vis-a-vis -vis you. And how do you get that extra skill in you to make sure that next time you have an opportunity like this, you don't fail. So all that, in a sense, also became an opportunity for me, that tolerance of failure. So instead mm. of, kind of going down the rabbit hole that, oh, I had so much expectation and I really wanted this role or I really wanted this project and then getting into depression or getting into you know, some kind of listlessness, I used that opportunity to understand that what is it that was not working and then making sure that I, I acquire those required skills or understanding or application so that next time when I do this, I'm able to do it effectively and reduce my chances of failure. And I think that's very important. You know, when you were talking about getting rejected from a role that you auditioned for, it's different from, uh, you know, how when we apply for a role, uh, you know, you're called for an interview, yeah, which is like an audition in some sense. And somebody says that, well, yeah, you are good, but there's somebody who's better. A lot of times, you know, we get upset. We are painful. We say, oh, that's a terrible company. I'm so glad I didn't make it. You know, I've heard that it's a lousy place and which also it's a you know, is one way of telling yourself that it wasn't me, it was actually the other person. How do actors deal with this? Because they probably go through this far more frequently than many others. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a very interesting point that you've made that, you know, a job interview is very much like auditioning for a role. And what you really need to understand, whether you're actors or whether you are going for a job position, I would not say mistake, but I would say like a shift in focus. One of the things that we do, we are focused too much on ourselves. Do we have the skills for this job? job? How would I present myself in the interview? Will I be able to answer everything correctly? And I think that is really the wrong focus. I mean, that is partially true, but that's really not the complete story. And one of the things which I tell young actors when I meet them is this, that, you know, getting a role is really not about how good an actor you are. Getting a role is really about capturing the imagination of the filmmakers. So what is the imagination that the filmmakers have? What is it they are looking for? 
what is it that in their head fits the role and if you are able to read that correctly you will be able to capture their imagination and get the role so i think same goes with job interviews rather than focusing on what my strengths are what my skills are what is the imagination that the interviewers have the company uh, people have what in their imagination is the person who would fit this role and if you're able to understand that which comes with a little research you go around finding out what kind of people held these positions what kind of people were successful in these positions the more you kind of do that and understand what is it exactly that is on their minds and you fit that role your chances of getting that role would be much higher rather than whether do i have the requisite skill set or not because at the end of the day as you keep moving up the echelons and the hierarchy it's really not so much about the skill it's really more about people management it's really more about managing different aspirations and egos it's really about reading the room correctly it's really about reading the market correctly it's really about reading the trends correctly it's really about finding that foothold somewhere in future where the sand is not defined and you don't know where you will land will you land on a water or will you land on the sand but able to envisage that foothold and then take everyone towards that foothold and making that into a reality is really the kind of thing which brings people around you which kind of attract people towards you so i think whether we are auditioning for a role or we are going for a job interview whether we have the requisite skill sets or not it is really understanding what is the winning proposition for the people who are the stakeholders and then capture their imagination and become that person which as for them would lead them into that future you know i was reading your uh, biography on imdb i talks about your running your own theater company the hoshroba gapator in mumbai and your productions being guards of the taj kissau dukia akri kitab ka and besides of course the ongoing storytelling project kisse bazi and the poetry performance project called poetryfication with fellow actor denzel smith in my book i talk about this as a classic career 3.0 where you are earning your revenue from multiple different ecosystems and you started off with a traditional career 1.0 yeah as a banker then you kind of juggled theater on the side and you know which is like a career to dot or your side gig then becomes something you monetize and now you are in this you know when you think about this model of earning from multiple revenue streams you are doing theater you are working in netflix films you are doing various things is it that people who are better at time management manage to do this are there people who are better at building networks across ecosystems who are good at doing this who are the people who can manage career three dot over well? Well, I wish I was earning the kind of money as it sounds from you <laughs> when you talk about me. But I think one thing which I have personally realized is that tech really offers a great opportunity to earn uh, money and to kind of strengthen our position in multiple ecosystems. So I think when people who are looking for a 3.0 kind of a career where they are in multiple ecosystems and they want to make sure it's just like your traditional entrepreneur who's into let's say FMCG also but at the same time he's also into some kind of a industry to industry setup where he's kind of into mining or something else mm-hmm. and not directly going to the customer so you have these conglomerates who who are into various industries and a lot of these industries do not have synergies in that sense they are not complementary industries they are absolutely different industries in terms of the end products or in terms of what who they are serving and they are thriving everywhere these conglomerates at the individual level it also becomes something like this and one of the ways i have found realized is that you must be able to understand how to use tech effectively especially if you want to reach out because you know your physical reach is always limited by the number of people you can meet or oh. the area where you operate but tech offers you you know internet offers you the opportunity to like really scale up those numbers so if you find ways of tapping technology to your advantage then you could reach a situ- system or a situation where you just have to put out your stuff out there and then the technology takes care of it by distributing it by by disseminating it by making sure it reaches out to a larger number and then it automatically starts getting monetized and you would find that you don't have to spend that much effort so i think in that is the brand building becomes very mm. that build a certain brand which attracts across multiple ecosystems and people are like oh no this is very interesting and this person is saying something here also then that also is very interesting and let's go there also to kind of understand 
how to package what you're offering. You know, some medium, you could do long form packages, some medium, you need to go, you know, shorter versions, uh, shorter consumable uh, packages, and then pitch it correctly. And then once you've kind of get the hack of it, you can go into these multiple ecosystems because you know exactly what system wants what. You've built yeah. a strong brand and then you just put across your stuff and the medium itself, the technology itself takes care of it. You know, you start reaping. Also, I think the other important thing is to understand how IPRs work. You've been a poet as well and I would love to have you recite some of your poetry for our listeners you know so it'll be great if you can you know recite something for us sure absolutely this one is called uh, a plain landscape in order to exist you must be on earth on a plain landscape rooted at a spot from where it seems all earth does is converge to your being to your standing skill the sky is a very giant Caught on the wrong foot, shedding a load off his shoulders. In order to exist, you must be on earth on a plain landscape with no shallow pits, no open caves, no ravines, no rifts, no ridges, no crevices, not even human architecture, no prose, poem or memory, not even a tittle-tattle tale. Because to enter an opening, a doorway or a text means to exit. You're gone. You cease to exist. Thank you. Beautiful. That was lovely. And... and Thank you so much. I'll just read uh, one more, uh, which is more like a uh, uh, Hindi one. Uh, is it okay if I read a Hindi one? Sure. Yes, of course. Uh, it's called Itihas Ki Kagar. Ye baat sach hai ki sab Yahudiyon se nafrat nahi karte the. Kuch mauka paras the, keval satta ke saath hi dekhte the. Kuch lob lalaj ki hold mein sirf lootne ki chaah rakhte the. Kuch majboor adesh anusar batai raah par hi chal sakte the. Kuch roz marra ke bhavar mein phase apni raay tak nahi rakhte the. To kuch rajneetik chakr ka ek daur, aaj kuch kal kuch aur samjhte the. Par afsos itihas ki kagar par ye sab jo nafrat nahi karte the. एक ही लग्गी से नापे जाते हैं सब के सब नाजी कहलाते हैं थैंक यू वाह वाह व्हाट डस द फ्यूचर लुक लाइक व्हेन यू थिंक अ कपल ऑफ इयर्स अहेड व्हाट आर यू थिंकिंग ऑफ डूइंग व्हाट आर द प्लेस यू आर वर्किंग ऑन टॉक टू मी अबाउट दैट to be very honest i think the future is pretty bleak because you know i see climate change happening i see uh, and all these wars that you're uh, looking at around us i mean eventually these are wars for resources and these are wars to exclude as many people as you want and only a handful of people really want to have their hands on these resources so i think this will aggravate as we move forward situations will become tough i don't know where we will all be in this scenario uh, as of now i i want to tell stories that i want to tell uh, i want to tell stories which possibly sensitize people to what is happening around us i want to tell stories about which sensitize people about our own understanding of who we are as human beings maybe create something which if not transformative is able to to affect people to a degree where it compels them if not changes them it compels them to ask questions shells to themselves and to those around them and you've done a play about sahid ludhiyanvi one right. of my favorite uh, poets tell me a little about that work it's a new play that we've done it's called map paldu palka shairu it's written by me ali husain and himanshu bashpai i mean these are two friends of mine i basically got a script written by me ali husain by ali ji kolamita talwar who runs this organization called arts for causes and she said she felt if i could make something out of it when i read the script i felt it needs a little more because Ali had written it uh, as a monologue in first person and I felt Sai being such a complex enigmatic personality you know I need to bring in other voices to make it a more 360 degree kind of a presentation on his life so I went to Himanshu who was uh, dastan on Sai right see him graciously these gentlemen agreed to give me a carte blanche on their script so I chopped edited took portions from one then just structured the whole thing into a play and we opened in September to a grand success and now we have the new year lined up uh, with shows in bombay delhi and hyderabad uh, including a show at uh, national school of dramas bharat rang mahotsav the annual prestigious theater festival and uh, we are excited and we are hoping that because size is such a grand life 
and such a fearless speaker of truth that uh, we are able to do justice to the great poet and bring his life on stage to people and maybe people will go out of the auditorium more curious about Sair and, and perhaps if nothing else then at least look for his songs on their playlists. <laughs> well, what is a dialogue from the play that has stayed with you if I were to ask you to sort of say that a line that encapsulate this kind of you know cause oh, um... मुझे यकीन था कि जिस ज़मीन को मैंने अपने खून और पसीने से पिछले दो साल से सींचा है अब उसमें फसल फूटने का वक्त आ गया है फैसला कर लिया मैं गरीब नहीं रहना चाहता था एंड आई थिंक यू नो दैट दैट लाइन जस्ट सिंपल बट कम्स विद सो मच कन्विक्शन मैंने फैसला कर लिया था मैं गरीब नहीं रहना चाहता हूँ which yeah. translated roughly means i decided that i don't want to stay poor yes yes and uh, and fair enough i mean he, he rose to great heights both in terms of his popularity and fame and also in terms of the money he earned he was one of the most powerful uh, writers of his times and danish it's uh, we are coming up to the hour and i just want to say thank you very much and wish you the very best for uh, your career as a performer as a storyteller as an actor and the career 3.0 life that you are leading i hope it will inspire many more people to pursue this kind of a combination thank you so much for being here Thank you Abhijit thank you for getting me on the show I hope uh, you know your listeners enjoy our conversation and I look forward to connecting with you again look forward to that